Hello and welcome to Sunshine for Your Life. As usual, I like to start out with a story and this time I'm going to be talking about a story of when I bought what turned out probably to be a duck but at the time I thought it was a chicken. Now I have here one almost exactly like the one that I bought. It's not exactly the same because the one I first bought somebody fell in love with and I decided just to give it to them. I thought I would never use it again but I have used that sermon again on a couple of occasions and so I bought one that's very much like it. Well, I went to, just to, to continue with the story. A few years ago, I was writing a children's sermon. I was involved with a church in which I did children's sermons, usually about once a week. And what happened was I wanted to get a big chicken or a big duck in order to show something as I was, as I was working uh, to write the sermon. And so I went with a friend of mine and we went into a store. It wasn't in this local area. We were in a different city in another place. And I saw this beautiful, what I thought was a chicken about this size. And I decided to buy it. So we, I picked it up. I had the money in my hand. I went to the um, a sales clerk and she did not want me to buy it. She says, you don't want it. You can't have it. You don't want it. And I said, well, this is a chicken and I'm going to buy it. And I didn't tell her it was a, for a children's sermon. What I told her was I am doing it for a special project that I'm working with, with children. And she says, you don't want this. And I asked her, why wouldn't I want it? Here it is. You know, I had the money in my hand. I had the chicken under my arm. She says, you don't want it because it's a duck. And I said, it looks like a chicken to me. And she said, no, it's a duck, and you don't want it. And I said, well, it looks fine to me. I can use it. There's no reason why I can't buy it. And she kept saying over and over again, you don't want it, you don't want it, you don't want it, you don't want to buy it. And I didn't understand it. Very rarely have I gone into a store where I was ready to buy something, and I had it in my hand, and I had money right in hand, and, uh, and it was all set. It was for sale. I had the money. I had the item. And, and somebody saying, you can't buy it. It just was not a good deal at all. So I had a friend with me. And uh, we started this discussion as to whether it was a chicken or a duck. And finally, I said, it doesn't make any difference to me whether it's a chicken or a duck. It fulfills the purpose that I have in mind for it, so I would like to buy it. Meanwhile, she's saying, you don't want it. You don't want to buy it. That one you don't want. And my friend who was with me said, why won't she let you buy the chicken? And she was standing right behind me, and I says, because she says it's a duck. I says, I don't care what it is. She says, so it's a duck. Tell her you want to buy the duck. I tried that. That didn't work either. Meanwhile, there's a line of people behind me. They're eager to check out and get on with their life. And I'm eager to check out and get on with my life. I had other things to do too, but she wouldn't let it go. She just wouldn't let it go. And I said to my friend behind me, I said, I'm not leaving this store without this duck or this chicken, or whatever it is. I'm not leaving the store without it. I says, you just watch. By this time, I'm getting hot under the collar. I'm getting steamed up. And I'm thinking, why would she not let me buy it? And then I thought, well, maybe she wants to buy it herself. Because, of course, salespeople can buy things that are in the store at a discount. Maybe she wanted to buy it herself. But it wasn't the only one. There were a group of them lined up in a row. So finally, I said to her, Look, I don't care whether this is a chicken. I don't care whether it's a duck. I don't care if it's a monster with purple polka dots on it. I am buying this stuffed animal, and she finally let me take it. There's only one or two other times I've had where a sales clerk did not want me to buy something that I had, that I had the money to pay for in cash, but it has happened on a couple of other occasions. Well, what does this lead me up to? I decided no matter what, I was going to get it, and I did get it. I was just, just purposely involved. I would not leave the store without it. And the idea is I wouldn't give up on what I wanted. I wouldn't give up on what I needed. And it, 
fulfilled my purposes. I don't even remember what was in the sermon. I had no idea what was in the sermon. I can't remember it, but I do remember this interchange and people lined up behind me and they want to get out and they're shuffling their feet and they're rolling their eyes and everybody is doing it. Meanwhile, this long-winded discussion is going on and whether it's a chicken or a duck. Well, I thought it was pretty funny when I looked back on it, but I did end up with them. So what I thought is, you know, I am not walking out on this duck. I am not walking out and leaving it. And, and it, it just, if you think of it and, and what you can apply it to, whatever you want, do it. Whatever you need, take it. Find some way to do it. Don't give up on something that you want just because there are obstacles in your way. And if you're a Christian and God wants you to do something and you know that, don't give up on it. There will be obstacles in your way and you know that's part of life to have obstacles in terms of what you're doing. Just keep at it and keep at it and keep at it. It reminds me of a little boy, and this is a true story. It has nothing to do with me, but it's a true story in terms of a little boy who had a boat. His father bought him a boat. And the boat, uh, he loved the boat. He played with the boat. He spent many hours taking that boat down the brook. Well, one day the, the boat disappeared on him. The current took him away, took it away. And he was very sad about that. He was very sad about losing his boat. And he and his father one day, a few months later, were walking down the street, and in a pawn shop is his boat. And so he went back to his house, and he got all of his change and all of his allowance money and anything he could find, and he and his father went into the pawn shop, and they bought the boat back. And so his comment to his father was this, it was mine to begin with, because his father had built it for him. It was mine to begin with, and now it is mine again. It belongs to me twice. And isn't that what it is in terms of Christianity, in terms of what God has done for us? We were created by God. We are his creatures. We belonged to him to begin with. And then after Adam and Eve's fall and sin came into the world, we had to be redeemed. And Jesus redeemed us through the power of his blood, through the crucifixion. So in a sense, we belong to him twice. We were his to begin with. We stepped out of where we were supposed to be, and God redeemed us and brought us back. God would not give up on us. God will not give up on you. He won't give up on anybody. He wants us. He wants us for himself, but all for good purposes. You are his if you are a Christian. Now, I used to do consultations with a psychiatrist friend of mine. He was a Christian psychiatrist, and every month I would consult with him in terms of cases that I was seeing as a professional counselor. I had my own counseling agency at that point. And he was also a good friend. So one time when I went down to see him, I usually saw him on a once-a-month basis for consultation, a prisoner was brought in. And this prisoner was all shackled. He had on his orange suit. He was handcuffed behind his back. And he, um, had, uh, he had chains on him. His feet were shackled. And what happened was he had a ball and chain. I'd never seen one of those ball and chains, but he had a ball and chain on him. And it was, must have been very, very heavy because as he walked, he stepped forward with one foot and then he would drag the other foot up. He couldn't lift up the foot. He would have to drag the foot up to match where the left foot was. So it was step, drag, step, drag. And I kind of felt sorry for him. There's just no way that he was going to be going anywhere. Absolutely no way. There was no escape for him. And as I said, I felt sorry for him because he had no freedom. Well, if you stop to think of it, uh, how, how we are, it kind of reminded me of Scrooge. You know, Scrooge and his, his scene when Marley comes to see him on that Christmas Eve, and Marley sees him, and he has been dead for any number of years, and he's dragging the chains behind him that he forged in life. He says, I'm dragging these chains behind him. These are the chains that I forged in life. Due to his bad business practices, due to the things he did that was unethical, he was like chained and shackled. 
And emotionally, if you're not a Christian, if you don't have the freedom that comes in knowing the Lord, you yourself can be shackled. You are just dragging things behind you. You are dragging all the problems that you have behind you. I have a poster that says, never be afraid to trust an unknown future to a known God. You may not know what's happening. You don't know why it's happening. You don't know what your future is, but God does because he knows everything. And you can learn to trust God and give problems to him because he knows the answers. He has the answer. He is the answer. I used to say to people every night, I give my problems to God. He's going to be up all night anyway. And if he's going to be up all night anyway, it's safe for me just to deposit everything that I have and just do it to him, just give it all to him, and then I don't have to worry about it anymore. You see, that little boy got his, duck, got his boat back, and I got the duck, if it was a duck or a chicken, I still don't know to this day for sure whether it was a duck or a chicken because I gave it away. But it looked very much like this one, so I really think it was probably a duck. It didn't matter at all in terms of what I said for my sermon because it, it would have been the same sermon. I could have had a stuffed cat and it could have been the same sermon. But that, that uh, duck or chicken, whatever it was, just appealed to me and it appealed to the children and I was able to use it. So it didn't really matter. John uh, 3.16, and I'm reading this out of the NIV, says, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Or the NIV says uh, eternal life. The King James says everlasting life. And with your freedom, however, comes your call. If you are going to be call to ministry, if you are born again, if you have a personal relationship with the Lord, then you have a call. You have gifts. God wants to use the gifts, and he wants you to, uh, he wants you to use them for him. Uh, John 14, 6 says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And I'm reading that, of course, out of the NIV. Now, it, it's true that the Bible says there's just one God and one Savior. And I know there are a lot of religions around where you can pick and choose what you want to believe. That there, some religions have many gods and you pick the God that you want to believe, but that's not the way it is in Christianity. In Christianity, there's one God and that one God you believe in. And in Isaiah, and I don't have it written down here, but in Isaiah 43, I know that the scripture says, I may not be saying it exactly right, but you know, I, even I, I am the Lord, and beside me there is no Savior. I and I, I, even I am the Lord, one God, and beside me, Jesus, there is no Savior. One God, one Savior. A group of gods, that's not true according to the Scripture. But of course, a, a, to be a Christian, you have to believe that the Bible is true. If you don't believe that the Bible is true, or you only accept certain parts of the Bible but not other parts, you're not going to be a Christian on that. You have to believe that the entire Bible is absolutely true, that there are no mistakes in it. Sometimes we may make a mistake in interpreting it, but the Scripture itself, one God, one Bible, one Savior. The Bible, of course, is made out of several books, 66 books, I believe, but it doesn't matter. It's all anointed by God. Different writers, different times, and they wrote, and they all agree with one another, even though they didn't even know each other, because they were re writing in different times of history. So you have to believe that that Bible is true. You have to believe it, and then you know that there is just one God and one Savior. There aren't a group of gods, and you choose one. There's just one. In Acts 4, verse 12, and I'm reading this out of the NIV, salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to men by which we must be saved. Now this says the same thing as Isaiah 43. 
There is no other name under this heaven that we need to be saved with except for Jesus. And it says it in the Old Testament and it says it in the New Testament. Even though the divisions of the Bible are Old and New Testament, they agree on everything. They just, they just fit together, hand in glove. And so if you know one, you kind of know the other. It's God who created it, the same God in history. But it doesn't matter the fact that you're reading the Old or the New Testament. It has the same belief. You have a place, and the place that you have is important. And you have to know that. You have to know how important you are to God because God wants you. He came to redeem you, just like a little boy. He buys you back again. And then what you do for him, and he gives you gifts, you serve him with the gifts that he has. In my case, in all my life, I've done a lot of teaching. I've done a lot of music. I've done a lot of preaching. And what I've done, I've done as a service for my church, and I've done as a service for God. So when you are, are really born again, and when you have a personal relationship with God, and that's what that term born again means, it means to have a personal relationship with God. When that happens, and the Bible says you are filled with the Holy Spirit because the Bible says you are the temple of the Holy Spirit, then God gives you a call to some kind of work for him. You're not just going to be sitting in a pew and doing nothing. You're going to have some kind of a ministry, and that ministry can be almost anything because God will anoint it to be important, whether you're helping another person or whether you're preaching or teaching or whatever you're doing. God will take care of you. You are alive in Christ, and you are really growing, and uh, he, will, he will view you almost like a vine attached to a branch because you are attached to him. You can do the work that God wants you to have. Now, I'm going to read John 15, verse 5, which says, and I'm reading it from the King James Version, I am the vine, and you are the branches. Whoever lives in me and I in him bears much fruit. Whenever you serve God, you bear fruit for him. And the Bible says we will bear fruit, and not just a little fruit, but if we belong to him, we will bear much fruit. Anytime you do something for God, it's always rewarded always rewarded. You know, the Bible says even a cup of cold water will not lose its reward if you're doing it for him. So he rewards everything you do. He gets the glory because he is, after all, God. You get the rewards because you're serving him. It's a very unique relationship. It's a very wonderful relationship because it gives you peace and it gives you joy. You know that God is all-powerful, you know that he's always present. You know that he has all knowledge. Those are the three characteristics of God that you really need to remember. He's omniscient. He knows everything. He's omnipotent. He has all power. He's omnipresent, which means he's there all the time. He's present everywhere. There's nowhere that you can go that you would get outside of the reach of God, nor would you want to if you're a Christian. When you realize that he knows everything, and that he does everything, and that he's all-powerful, and that he will work in you, and that he will give you peace, and that he can give you healing, and he can give you everything that you need, then you start to realize that you're a very significant person. And not in, a, not in a proud, arrogant way, but you're important because God has chosen you and he wants you. And he wants you to be with him and he wants you to help him because not because he needs you, because he wants to have a relationship with you. Your love relationship with God is the most important thing in your life. It out-trumps everything. What you are in him and your relationship with him is more important than what you do. But that doesn't mean you don't work for him. You still do work for him. And he shows his power through you, and he gets his work done through you, and he gets the glory, and you have the reward. So as you allow God to work in you, then you will find that he is with you all the time, and you'll see how he meets your needs. If you look back in your history, you can see times when you've had difficulties, but God's been there and he's been taking care of you all along. And sometimes that just comes out so clearly that you know that that's the case. He will not give up on you. 
He will not give up in helping you. He will not ignore you. He will not ever leave you alone. You won't fall through the cracks. And uh, you, you're never going to be left in the lurch because he has a passion for you and he thinks about you all the time. Um, Philippians 1, 6, I want to read this, says, Being confident of this, that he who began a good work in you will carry it on to completion until the day of Christ. And what that means is when he has done his work with you and when he's working with you, he will continue to do that work until you, you pass on to be with him, to go home to be with him, or until the rapture comes and you're no longer on this earth, whatever. He will always be there with you. He will always help you. Um, so it, it's wonderful that you can uh, start from nothing to being something really important because, the, you know, the Bible says God is no respecter of persons. He loves us equally as much. And the Bible also says that he is with you always, even unto the end of the world. You know, he is always with you. He never leaves you alone. And he knows everything about you. If you study, look at Psalm 139, he talks about the fact that he knows you. He knows all your days. He knows what every day was going to be like before any one of them came to be. He knew everything about you from the beginning. He has, there's not a thing about you that he doesn't know. Now, that's not a scary thing. It's a good thing. Because if he knows everything about me, then he knows what my needs are. And if he knows what my needs are, he knows what I need in order to fulfill those needs, to fulfill the voids in my life. And he just does it. I remember being with my mother and our furnace had kind of blown up. Or water, I guess it was the water heater that had kind of blown up. And we had to get another one. And I was riding with her, she was driving her car, and she was bemoaning the fact that things happen, and these things are expensive. And then I said, do you realize that God knew from before the foundation of the earth that this is what was going to happen to you today, and that he has the answer for it. He knows where we're going to get the new hot water heater. He knows what it's going to cost. He knows what he's going to do to help us. And he's had it planned from before the foundation of the world. Nothing takes him by surprise. And sure enough, we got a terrific deal on a new hot water heater. It didn't cost near as much as it normally w you normally would have expected it. It was somebody who bought it and decided they didn't need it, and they sold it for a fraction of its value, and it was brand new. These are the kinds of things that God does to take care of us in our everyday life. You know, my everyday life included buying a chicken or a duck, and everybody's everyday life includes something. And so you can be sure that God will help you. And, when it's, and it's wonderful to think of the fact that he releases you, he gives you freedom, he rewards you for what you do. And I'm going to close with two verses, both from the NIV. First of all, Isaiah 53, 5. But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities, the punishment that brought us peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. His wounds, the cru crucifixion wounds, the nail wounds, where he, he was pounded into that cross and he shed his blood, it heals us, it frees us. And in John 3.16, also out of the NIV, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. I keep on saying everlasting, but the, it means the same thing. The NIV translates it as eternal life, but it means the same thing. So I'm going to close it here. And remember the main message that if God wants you to do something, you're going to have obstacles. Keep at it. Don't give up. And if you have a personal dream that's important to you and it seems reasonable, then just follow it. Just work with it. And if obstacles come, you can usually work around obstacles or get above obstacles and just keep going. Keep on going. I guess that's the message. But remember, it is God who redeems you, that gives you eternal life, and he will also give you the direction in which he wants you to, do, to go. So we'll close it here, and I will see you next time. Any questions you have, any suggestions of anything you want me to cover, I will do that on the air. Just email me at the station, and I will answer you on the air. 
Thank you, and we'll see you next time.